Hello and welcome on the show. It's Plus Sports Special on Plus TV Africa. My name is Mikhail Tenebu and I am here today to talk about something that is going to change the landscape of uh, European football. And at the same time, I'm going to talk about how we can take examples from it as to how to change our uh, football reality in Nigeria. Our football league has had problems for the longest time and we're still going through a period of trial and error just to find the right way to get things uh, moving in the right direction. But since a lot of us pay attention to European football and it's the holy grail of the top level football in the world, it seems worth taking, paying attention to what is about to take place. I speak, of course, of the, um, the new financial fair play rules that are about to come into effect from this summer. They were introduced in 2022, but the effects will really be felt from the summer of 2023. And with me on the show to discuss this is um, Temi Tayo Luwokiri. The, he's a sports lawyer. He's also uh, a sports educator, a clean sports educator uh, slash advocate. And um, together we're going to traverse this particular story and figure out why there was even a need for new rules in the first place. Now, back in 2011, financial fair play also known as FFP, was introduced by European football's governing body, UEFA, as it aimed to stop clubs involved in European competition from spending more than they earn. The basic principle was that beyond a small loss initially set at 5 million euros, over three years, clubs' expenditures, particularly around transfers and wages, must match their income. The rules were initially hailed for curtailing losses clubs were willing to risk for the possibility of on-pitch success. However, by 2017, English Premier League EPL football clubs had, uh, were recording combined pre-tax losses of £110 million per year. And that was even before the COVID-19 turndown hit football's top table. Club finances across the big five leagues are now at a tipping point where huge losses will soon become untenable. Several members of the European Football's Nouveau Riche were able to find ways around the FFP rules. 2020 saw Manchester City fined 30 million euros and banned for two seasons from the Champions League by UEFA for alleged serious breaches of FFP rules. The club was found to have overstated sponsorship revenue and break even information in accounts submitted to UEFA between 2012 and 2016. However, as the breaches were uh, found to be time barred, the Court of Arbitration for Sports, CAS, overturned the ruling and reduced City's fine to 10 million euros. The ruling was said to, uh, by many critics to have left FFP rules dead in the water. Now, I, like I said, I am joined on the line by Tami Tyre. Tami, hello. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, Mukai. Good morning. Um, thank you for having me here today. Sorry, Tami. I, I, we can't seem to hear you. Yes, hello. Can, can you hear me now? Okay, I I can hear you now. Welcome on the show, Tammy. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right. Now, obviously, um, this is kind of your home base, your home ground. Understanding these rules and how um, they apply to sports is how you, un is how you uh, tra uh, navigate sports in general. Now, European football, as I have said, is the top notch of football in the world and it sets an example for the rest of the world it sets an example for football in asia in the middle east and in africa and while we're still trying to catch up in africa they've changed the rules again given the new rules which um 
would are called uh, so is popularly referred to as new financial fair play rules, but the real name is um, financial sustainability rules. Given these new rules coming into effect and the examples of Barcelona and Juventus, um, is it fair to say the financial fair play rules introduced in 2011 has been a failure? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I must say first that um, it will be premature to say that the rules um, uh, introduced in 2011, that, that came in force in 2011, uh, have been a failure. And uh, that is because uh, over the period for which the, the rules subsisted, uh, we had a number of um, uh, sanctions for clubs and in, uh, under that rule, including Manchester City, as you mentioned. And um, where people may get it wrong is that uh, in respect of those rules, uh, most of the uh, the uh, issues that are dealt with under those rules are still subject to some other uh, 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 adjudicatory body, as is CAS in the case of Manchester City. And CAS uh, adjudicates on issues on a case-by-case -case basis, and a lot of factors could, have, uh, could determine why clubs uh, may suffer less uh, 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 sanctions, as uh, maybe people expect. And because of that, you, I, I would be very reluctant to say the uh, former, um, the XYL FFP rules were a failure. But this, first and foremost, like, as they came in, they, mm -hmm. kept, they kept clubs on their toes and then made it important for clubs to uh, comply by those rules themselves and try to be solvent. All right. Um the fact is, every um, new law, every new rule has loopholes. Um, unfortunately, um, it usually takes the execution of those rules um, for people to test the limits. Lawyers to start to poke and prod at finding the holes where they may be. Until practice, until it comes into practice, we won't know about what these new financial sustainability uh, loopholes will look like. But regarding financial fair play, it, the original, um, what do you see where, as the deficiencies that existed in the rules? Uh, well, first, um, as has become as has come to the fore recently, hmm. uh, the issue of amortization has been a, a uh, subject of huge debates amongst um, uh, commentators of European football. Uh, this is because amortization on the accounting books allows clubs to actually spread the uh, cost of transfers over the length or the lifespan of the player's contracts. Mm -hmm. And in that light, you find that sometimes when uh, even transfer fees are, are reported uh, and the outlay may seem very massive, uh, some of those transfers themselves are not, uh, you find that those um, transfer fees are not exhaustively uh, uh, paid or uh, put into the account books immediately. Mm -hmm. And that means uh, over the term of a player, that, such a player that signed on that tra uh, such transfer fee uh, contract, the transfer fee itself is calculated against the, the period of, uh, of that contract. Mm -hmm. Meaning if you sign the player for maybe a, a 50 million pound transfer, you find that if you sign that player up, uh, up on a five-year deal, on the accounting books, what's, what that will actually reflect is 10, 10 million pounds a year hmm. or, or, uh, as the outlay on the player, excluding the wages, of course. But then that has helped some clubs to offset the possibility of running or falling fall foul of financial betting. Mm. And then it, it has now created a tendency of clubs to, uh, for one, try to um, sign players on to very lengthy contracts that uh, will help them offset the, the uh, requirements of um, financial spending. Of course, you're speaking about so, Chelsea, right? Um, they have been recently uh, called out for using those tactics 
to um, sign players on to seven years, eight year contracts to defer payments and spread it over a long period. Um, but one thing I notice about the rules is that for the English teams whose um, uh, broadcasting revenue and other means of income seems to trump and super, surpass the rest of the top five leagues, um, that rule might help them more because they can always make up for the cost of buying these players. Because every season, every year, the, the money they earn from broadcast seems to increase. Whereas in places like Spain, um, the breakdown of the money uh, favors the top two clubs. Um, uh, same thing in Germany. Uh, but even then, Barcelona have run into some serious financial problems. How, how then has it been okay? How did financial fair play, if the financial fair play rules were supposed to create a means of oversight over these uh, clubs, how is it that Barcelona could have gone under the radar for so long to the point where they are 1.3 billion uh, euros in debt and um, and now even having to sell off parts of their uh, assets for a 25-year period just to make up for the cost that they're owing to pay off creditors to meet La Liga's uh, wage rules and to even still buy players, invest in the squad. How is it that uh, the oversight of UEFA using FFP has failed so uh, terribly in that particular circumstance? Well, I think in the case of Barcelona, you find that um, uh, some of the issues they had, especially last summer, was mostly in respect of um, registering players over wages, hmm. not exactly um, transfer fees uh, that now fall short and um, fall particularly under uh, FFP in that light. Mm -hmm. It was the, as you mentioned, the La Liga registration um, uh, requirements and how they needed to meet that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I don't know why, I cannot say exactly why uh, maybe Barcelona may have not come under a, a, a purview of um, a very public um, UEFA investigation for uh, violating FFP at the moment. I cannot mm -hmm. speculate on that. But what I do know is uh, the levers that they activated over uh, uh, the summer multiple yeah. occasions uh, yeah. during the summer yes on, on multiple occasions in the summer are uh, some sort of revenue for them to now it, the legitimacy of the re revenue is uh, a subject for UEFA or any other uh, uh, government body that uh, oversees Barcelona and the affairs to, uh, to determine but as long as those revenues are in place uh, they, they are the ones, uh, it is those revenues that they use to offset whatever transfer fee outlays that they make. Now, that is entirely different from UEFA and, and La Liga's um, registration rules where they cannot go beyond a certain salary cap. Okay, okay. so salary cap and um, the FFP rules, I think, are a little bit different from each other in, in that respect. So, uh, in Barcelona's case, I can't exactly say why. They have not uh, come under uh, yeah. UEFA's investigation for breach of FFP. Now, um, I suspect that Barcelona was able to skate under the rules for a, a long time because they are a traditional uh, institution within uh, football, European football in particular. Um, and that leads me to my next question. Some had accused UEFA of leaving open certain loopholes that allowed for big clubs to continue to spend beyond what smaller clubs would deem as fair. Um, obviously, uh, the more money you make is what is supposed to determine how much you can spend on uh, wages, on transfers. But, um, and smaller clubs are going to always complain about bigger clubs having an unfair advantage. But it seems to me like um, one of the deficiencies of uh, um, the financial fair play rules, especially as they were uh, enacted under Michel Platini, there were accusations that um, they didn't go far enough and that they even, in some regards, benefited the top big clubs in the world, purposely so. Uh, do you agree with that sentiment? 
But I, I, I will, you will know, find it difficult to agree entirely with that sentiment. And that is, I, I, I'll cite the reason why. Now, the reality of uh, football in Europe, or anywhere in the global world, anyway, is that uh, certain entities will earn more in revenue than some other entities. Mm -hmm. And that is going to a, a, no, a number of factors. As you mentioned, Barcelona being a traditional club, being a, a global institution where a lot of people recognize that institution, a lot of people patronize them, uh, that, that attracts revenue, of, automatically attracts revenue. And Barcelona, compared to me, most of the other clubs in Spain, I will not operate on the same stratosphere in terms of revenue generation. And that means Barcelona, for that reason, can um, commit itself to more uh, uh, to huge transfer outlays, okay, mm -hmm. compared to a club like um, Celta Vigo or some other clubs in Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, I believe this is a natural, uh, uh, sort of organic uh, 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 reality of, 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 the, of the football, of, of, of institutions in football, rather, mm -hmm. uh, uh, themselves. So uh, I do not think the financial fair play rules themselves, of themselves, can bridge that gap. Mm. Okay, what I think, and, and if you look at the object of the uh, financial fair play itself, it is to ensure solvency, to ensure stability at clubs, and to ensure cost control. Mm. Now, once those are, uh, are, are, are out for people to understand, you, you realize that on a club-to-club uh, a -club basis, on uh, uh, determining on the level of the each, each individual club, you look at, okay, can this club remain solvent with this kind of expense compared to its revenue? Now, you, you should not be comparing uh, a club's revenue, like a small club's revenue, to a bigger one's uh, revenue in that, in, in that respect to, to um, offset it against financial value. I, do, I do right. think that's the right way to look at it. All right. This uh, is a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Temi Dyer, now, what will yes. be the effects of the new uh, spending caps on clubs? Because... Currently, by the summer, there is going to be a demand that clubs only spend 90% of their income on um, transfers, wages uh, for players, for staff, and even um, the cost of paying uh, player agents. Um, all of that has to fit in within that 90% uh, of their income. And the next season is going to drop again, to about 75 70%. And the season after that, it's going to drop to 60%. So uh, what, what does this mean for the, what will be the effects of this new spending caps on clubs and how they spend going forward? Uh, thank you. I, I believe that, um, personally, I believe that uh, uh, the spending cap, as, as you have earlier proceeded, uh, actually. Uh, first and foremost, I believe clubs will find their way around mm. uh, um, committing certain outlays as they have been already at this time. We all agree that the transfer market has gone crazy with the, mm. the fees. I do not think that will change so much, okay. to be honest. I think um, clubs will find and devise more means to generate more revenue. And especially primarily clubs, I do not think... Um, the broadcasting uh, revenue is going to uh, be lower than it is over the next two, three years. So, and if you uh, evaluate possible spending or potential spending against the backdrop of um, increasing revenue, then of course they can make more ugly. Now, uh, I believe by 2025, 2026, that 90% um, uh, goes down to 70% at that time. Mm. Now, as it continues to... Uh, go down in notch, I believe more and more means to to generate revenue, more and more uh, innovations around generating revenue would be what clubs would look out for. And this, now, for example, uh, I, I'm listening to you. But I, like you said, this will not affect the market valuation of players, nor will it cap the prices I, I, clubs can demand for their players. So clubs will just have to find new ways to generate money. Is there any more any more from that uh, tree that clubs can squeeze? Because football is already global. Big clubs yes. are already global. In fact, Manchester United is already on the stock exchange. Um, what more 
can clubs do to gain more revenue going forward? Well, as, as I said earlier, I believe that, for example, for one, the broadcasting deal in the Premier League, for example, I think for the next few years, and, and um, I do not have my figures right now in that respect, but I believe there are projections that it will even go a, a, a tad higher than what they've been able to generate in that respect. I see. Now, once that is the case, you then look at the uh, a solvent that, as each individual Premier League club is already in, in, because of the uh, outlay, uh, the revenue they generate from the broadcasting rights. The individual clubs and how they go about generating revenue is what I believe will also intensify the efforts that they make. For example, about two, three seasons ago, I believe the uh, Premier League clubs did not have uh, sponsorship on their patch, on, on side patches. Yes, yeah. Now that is in place. Mm. Now that is in place. The, uh, next uh, season, maybe uh, them introducing sponsorship on the back. There are clubs in Europe that have that. Mm. So you just device, it will be clubs devising more means to, to generate revenue. And because of the money in the Premier League, clubs outside the Premier League, especially in Europe, and even the clubs in the Premier League themselves, will continue to demand new transfer fees because they believe these clubs are solvent enough. I'm sorry, they are, they are uh, 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 well financed enough to, to afford those fees. Now, I want to even pr uh, prioritize valuations of players and transfers. Are we going to see a slowdown in player movements from club to club? Uh, sorry, I, I need to clarify. What do you mean? In, in, in between leagues or... Uh, from, because... Uh, all, all over Europe. All, all over Europe. Because right now, um, clubs have a habit of placing an, an exalt, uh, exorbitant amount of value on their player, particularly when they don't want to lose that player or they want to squeeze as much value from that player as possible. And there's no current um, uh, UEFA lever to regulate that. So clubs can name their price because of comp competition laws. Uh, are we going to see a slowdown, maybe perhaps in the first few years, while clubs figure out how to go around, uh, figure out the loopholes of these new rules? Are players going to stop moving at the rate that they are currently moving? Well, there are two trends that I personally have, uh, have noticed uh, with um, European football over the last um, one year plus, as just an observer of, um, as a football fan myself. Now, I have uh, seen recently a trend of footballers running down their contracts. Mm. Okay? And, um, that I believe, uh, if I would predict, that I predict will be a trend that will uh, that subsist over the next few years with players running out their contracts and going on the bus man. Okay? okay. Now, that already eases the... There, there are already a plethora of examples in that respect, actually, over the last one year plus. A lot of players run down their contracts and make the move to another club, uh, have all the uh, AC, have all the cards to play and, and have a number of clubs they could pick from. It um, allows players to have um, a, a freedom of, um, of, of, of uh, movement in that, that respect, proper freedom of movement that I expect. Now, apart from that, what I also think and what I have seen as well is that Premier League clubs, and I, and I think we need to discuss more of the Premier League clubs because they have most of the revenue and they have most yeah. of the money. Yes. Will not stop. I do not believe uh, uh, transfers will reduce in that way because of the fact that the Premier League clubs are so equipped that they can always go even to the biggest leagues, the other uh, uh, top five leagues in, in Europe, go in there and pick up players from clubs that are, are struggling for air. Clubs in, uh, outside England are constantly struggling. Mm. And I believe that if clubs continue to demand exorbitant fees mm. in this respect, and uh, maybe the Premier League clubs become taken aback and they, they probably withdraw from uh, uh, paying these exorbitant fees with FFP in mind, clubs who need the revenue ordinarily because some clubs rely on these transfer fees to stay afloat will begin to become reasonable with their demands, I believe. Now, so, I, 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 okay. go on, please, uh, finish up. 
Yes, yeah, so as as you as you have said uh, as you have said earlier that you 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 think the FFP itself may possibly um, uh, 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 result in um, a reduction in those transfer fees. It may be an indirect one, not necessarily over maybe the next one year, or the next two years. Mm. It may be a, a product of next five years where the market, the landscape now changes entirely. All right, now. Uh, for going forward, because no set of rules are perfect. At some point, um, even these F FSR rules will become um, <laughs> not as worth the paper that they're written on. There will be too many holes to plug up, and UEFA will come up with a brand new uh, set of rules. Um, so, and they will be working on rec based off of recommendations. And since the transfer market is part of the l uh, large chunk of why clubs spend m as much as they do, uh, that expenditure, should the next iteration of these rules consider a cap on the valuation of football players to stabilize the market? Well, I believe that is a possibility, and I, I, I know for one that that is a conversation that has been had over the years, really. Um, uh, transfer caps, salary caps, actually have been conversations that have been muted at up to FIFA level, actually. Mm. So I, I, I think that is something that will definitely come into consideration. Now, uh, the, the effect of that against the backdrop of European law is another com conversation entirely. Uh, but I, I believe that is a, a conversation that will continue and it's something that may likely come into uh, to the fore in the next two, three years, really. All right. Now, I want to bring this home um, for the Nigerians. Um, we have this story 